Now, you, many of you may know, and some of you may not know, we had a change in itinerary uh, today. About 7.45, I got an email from A.J. Giannopoulos, who was going to give our program on the women of RCA in World War II. And he's very sick today, so he just couldn't do it. So uh, that's the, the bad news. Uh, any other group would hang a sign up and say, closed, we're done, we can't do it. But not us, we've got another bullet in the gun. And his name is Clay Stuckey. <laughs> And he's going to give a program that I'll tell you just about in just a, a couple of minutes here. So we're fortunate for that. He's given it about 20 times throughout the state and even out of state. So it'll work out. It's echoing. You need to turn off one of the speakers. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. I've turned the echo thing down. Susan Dyer from the History Center is going to make a short statement before we begin. So I didn't get the email till about 10. I was really panicked. Uh, so thank you, Clay. We really appreciate it. But I did want to mention, if you haven't seen, that we are going to have our second community scanning event, a History Harvest. This one is in Bloomington. It's actually at the History Center. The first one was in Ellisville, so we're asking people to bring photographs, letters, documents, anything from before 1970 um, so that we can scan them in. You get to keep the original. We scan it in so that it's available in our archives uh, so that we can use it for exhibits, programs, have it available for the public to see. So we're basically looking for the things that, you know, you know you have and we don't know you have, um, all those things that are tucked away. So it's December 1st, Saturday, 10 to 2. Um, we're looking at available parking. There should be parking in the back lot as well as on the uh, streets around us. So hopefully you, you can find something and bring it out, and we would really appreciate that. We also have on December 8th our second open house. So we just had one this past week, but we're, this one coming up is a log cabin Christmas, and we're doing this in conjunction with the Wiley House, um, Wiley by Candlelight program. So we are going to have our log cabin decorated for Christmas as it would have been in the 1800s. So that's a free event if you want to come out for that as well. That's from 4 to 7 p.m. on December 8th. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Susan. And David Lemon had a, had a comment he'd like to make too. David's actually one of our past presenters, so uh, he knows what he's doing up here. Oh, boy. Um, I just wanted to mention that we lost one of our uh, attendees. Uh, Don Madsen, who usually sat right there, uh, bald head, and one of the best genealogists in Monroe County, passed away uh, either over the weekend yeah. or Friday. Yeah, a few days ago. And uh, the thing about Don, he's done genealogy a lot longer than there's been Ancestry.com. So he had to do it the hard way. But uh, he was uh, Mr. Cousin to most people in Monroe County, especially up around Ellettsville. So uh, he'll be missed. But, uh, oh, and he's my cousin, too. <laughs> Thanks, Cousin David. Uh, George Carpenter has a couple things to say, as usual. The Minister of Propaganda. Thanks, Mike. Uh, once again, I'd like to introduce my wife, Mary Ann Zalazak Carpenter, who came, comes to you from Edinburgh, Indiana this morning. Uh, let's see. 
like to thank everyone for attending. Now, this is a tough day, and we're going to talk about some provisional things that we're going to do in the future regarding your email. Uh, also, would like to thank the Legion for hosting our presentation today. They're ever gracious that we're here. Thank you very much. Please be generous with our servers, otherwise you may be serving yourself one of these <laughs> Don't expect me to do it. Okay. Uh, thanks to cats. As always, uh, great to have them here. Looking forward to your presentation next year. Hey, George. Sir? This is their third anniversary of their first program. Our third anniversary of cats being on board with us. They provide an invaluable service helping us do history <coughs> for future generations. We have over 40 presentations now on YouTube. That's the next thing I want to talk about. In the past, you've received emails from me with a huge long list of the different presentations that we have. In the future, you will be receiving a single URL that will tell you how to go to the U site, and you can look up the different presentations yourself. So that, I hope that will sort it for you a little bit. The idea is to make it less complicated and less boring to have to read this over and over again. The next thing is with regarding the winter weather coming up and the, uh, the event that we have another uh, speaker unable to attend. Uh, it's my intention that if we have something like this happen again, like for weather, we're going to have to, to postpone the presentation or whatever, to immediately that morning or as soon as I find out, fire out an email to you. So you might check your email in advance coming to one of these presentations. If you don't see anything, uh, that means that we're very likely on board to be able to do it. But I handle the emails and I'm 50 miles away in Bloomington and I never know till I get out on the road what it's going to be like. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, a long trip sometimes. So I'm always interested to hear what you think about the presentations by email. Those of you who are attending for the first time or not on our email distribution list, please see me at the end of the presentation. We'd be more than happy to put your name on the email. If you're tired of receiving emails, just send me a note asking to unsubscribe, and I'll be happy to take your name on. Is there anything from you folks for the good of the cause? I appreciate your time. Have a good day. All right, thanks, George. Yeah, I should mention, too, my, my mother's here, Mary Carter. She's always here to cheer me on, and wife Paulette's up here. I'll, I'll give a rundown of the, the future programs. And as we know, sometimes, you know, they may or may not happen in the order I've gotten there because stuff happens. Uh, the next one will be December 18th. We had to make it the 18th because the, the regular Tuesday would be on Christmas Day. So that wouldn't work. You mean you don't want to spend Christmas with me? <laughs> sure. Um, no, we don't. <laughs> But on that day, December 18th, Derek Ritchie is going to uh, return to show more, show more old photos from the late 1950s that we scanned down at the uh, old Herald Telephone, <laughs> their files. And uh, people always like photos, and this is no exception. It'll be good. Uh, January 15th, it's a, in January, it's five Tuesdays, so we're going to work another one in there on the 15th, in between. That was going to be Clay. Now it's going to be AJ. We're flipping shows, so he'll be here. January 15th with his RCA show. Uh, then January 29th, 2019, IU history professor emeritus James Madison will give a program on the bicentennial of Monroe County. February 26th, Carrie Beam, the director of the Wiley House Museum, will give a program on its history and an update on what it has to offer Bloomington. March 26th, our own George Carpenter, right there, uh, we'll give a program on the rich history of the Monon Railroad, and uh, George knows as much about the Monon as about anybody. He says he of, does. There were a lot of people around that forgot more about the Monon <laughs> than I'll ever know. And then April 30th, Michael White of Cats TV, their boss, uh, is going to give a program on the history of Cats and the many ways it serves our county. 
May 28th. Uh, local historian and author James Capshu will give a program on the life of Herman B. Wells, and he has written a book about Wells, which is very good. June 25th, Brad Cook of IU Photo Archives will return to show more vintage local photos he has from his huge collection. Uh, July 30th, Christine Friesel of the Monroe County Public Library is going to give a program on the local Underground, underground Railroad. Uh, she's going to be sharing new information. She just found out about this. Uh, it just came to light. August 28th, John Summerlot will return. He was our, our presenter last month. He'll give a program on Indiana University and its military history. September 29th, 2019, this will mark the bicentennial month of the First Presbyterian Church in Bloomington. And local historian Owen Johnson, who gave our September program, will give that. So we've got a lot of talented people lined up to show up here. Which brings us to today. Uh, as I said, Clay, uh, I'm going to pay for his lunch today, once, since he stepped in to do this. What a guy. Uh, as I said, he's given this program all over the state and even out of state. It's, uh, it's an excellent program and an unusual one, too. It's called The Trials and Tribulations of the Corpse of Abraham Lincoln. So he'll, I'll let you explain to you what that means. <laughs> Okay. Should be okay now. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. It's not working. Thank you, Mike. That's working. Uh, as evidence that this is not an elaborate bait and switch, which you might have thought. I must apologize to you for not having my regular coat and tie. I have never spoken a program anywhere in my life that I didn't wear a coat and tie. My wife informs me that this is the Mr. Lincoln Rose. Very good. But we're not here to talk about horticulture. But where Mr. Lincoln's body is concerned, there will be a great number of plantings. <laughs> Our story begins just a few hours before this picture was taken. On the morning of July 15, 1865, in Washington, D.C., across the street from Ford's Theater in the Peterson House, where at 722, in that bed, Abraham Lincoln breathed his last. And after the Lincoln family pastor, Dr. Phineas Gurley, gave a prayer, Secretary of War Stanton lifted his head and famously said, and now he belongs to the ages. At least you believe that if you believe what the overwhelming majority of historians who have written about Lincoln's death have said that Stanton said that. They get this from the biography of Lincoln written 25 years later by Lincoln's secretary, John Hay, who was there in the room when Lincoln died. He wrote it along with another Lincoln secretary, John Nicolay. But on the other hand, if you believe a handful of more modern historians, those generally historians of the Lincoln assassination, then what Stanton said was, he belongs to the angels now. They base this on what James Tanner, a professional stenographer who was there when Lincoln died, wrote many years after, and there's the rub. Nobody can pinpoint just where or when James Tanner purportedly said or wrote this. If you believe what one and a half, at least one and a half, historians have written or uh, believe, I humbly account myself as the one half historian. <laughs> What Secretary of War Stanton actually said in the Peterson House the moment Lincoln died was absolutely nothing. 
that one historian is Walter Starr, the most recent biographer of Secretary of War Stanton. And in that biography, he credits Stanton with saying the traditional, now he belongs to the ages. But in my personal conversations with Mr. Starr, we are both in agreement that Stanton most likely said absolutely nothing, and I'm willing after the program to discuss the evidence that would more or less substantiate that. But for right now, uh, I have just given you the gist of the controversy. However, Mr. Starr and I do believe that Stanton probably said, now he belongs to the ages, within hours or a day or two, and he said it in the presence of John Hay, who was a good enough writer to fudge things and put the quote, when Lincoln died, where it has the most impact. But that, of course, is strictly a surmise on our part. Well, <clears throat> regardless of whether Lincoln belongs to the ages or the angels, the movers and shakers in Washington, D.C. thought his body belonged in the crypt directly below the rotunda of the Cap Capitol building. That crypt had been intended for George Washington, but George thought that he would rather spend eternity with his family at the uh, family crypt at Mount Vernon, and that's where he continues to reside. <laughs> for many years, that crypt housed the uh, catafalque, the catafalque, uh, where uh, was intentionally, uh, originally built to, for Lincoln's casket to reside on and has been used whenever anybody lies in state in the Capitol Rotunda. Now you can see it in the new visitor center on the east side of the uh, uh, Capitol building. Although nobody bothered to ask Mrs. Lincoln about where she wanted her husband buried. When she heard that he was to be buried in Washington, she insisted that Mr. Lincoln would be buried in Springfield. And when the city fathers in Springfield heard this, their collective eyes were lit up with visions of tourism dollars, and they immediately decided that Lincoln had to be buried in downtown Springfield. Once again, nobody bothered to ask Mrs. Lincoln and they began negotiating to purchase the Mather property, where later the state capitol building would be built. And even before negotiations were completed in buying the property, they started to work on building and finishing a temporary tomb. Night and day they worked to have this temporary tomb completed by the time Lincoln's funeral train got to Springfield. Remember that everyone concerned knew that a substantial temporary tomb would have to be built somewhere to last the few years it would be necessary to raise the money and design a properly monumental tomb for the martyred president. It is interesting that the artist who made the woodcut showing soldiers standing guard didn't realize that Lincoln never made it to that tomb and therefore there was nothing to guard. When Mrs. Lincoln heard about the plan, she was adamant that the burial would be about a mile and one half north of downtown Springfield in Oak Ridge Cemetery. The city fathers could not believe that Mrs. Lincoln would turn down the nice new tomb and continued on with the work. But Lincoln's son, Robert, conveyed his mother's insistence that Mr. Lincoln was going to Oak Ridge Cemetery or to the Washington Crypt or to Chicago, but under no circumstances was he going to downtown Springfield. And so Mr. Lincoln was buried in Oak Ridge and the city fathers were stuck with an empty tomb. That tomb, or at least portions of it, still lies underground just north of the current Illinois State Capitol building. A cranial autopsy was performed on Mr. Lincoln, and then he was embalmed arterially with zinc chloride by Henry Cattell of the firm of Drs. Brown and Alexander. There was no cavity treatment in the embalming. 
After the funeral in Washington, the body of Lincoln was loaded aboard his funeral car to begin the 1,654 mile long journey back to Springfield. This route was followed uh, as closely as possible, but not exactly the route he took to Washington to assume the presidency back in 1861. The body was removed from the train in 10 cities for viewing and services. At each time, Mr. Lincoln's body was touched up by one of the two morticians from Brown and Alexander who were along on the trip. Clearly, over the 19 days between Mr. Lincoln's death and his arrival in Springfield, the body was deteriorating. Embalming in the United States was in its infancy. Just how much it deteriorated depended upon the eye of the beholder. Democratic newspapers thought the body in worse shape than Republican newspapers. <laughs> My own opinion is that if anyone here were to view a friend or loved one at visitation in a local funeral home, who was in the same condition that Mr. Lincoln was by the time he got to Springfield, they would probably think it should have been a closed casket. But people in the mid-19th century were far more accustomed to the sights and smells of death than we are. I suspect that they would have been more understanding and less shocked than we would have been. After all, when the casket was opened for the last time, 36 years later, the body hadn't improved any, and yet it was quite recognizable. That funeral car was a newly made presidential car that Lincoln had never seen, let alone used. He was supposedly scheduled to visit on April 16th, the day after he died. The car had an interesting history. After falling on hard times, it was bought by an entrepreneur, restored, and made into a tourist attraction. Unfortunately, it burned in 1911, the victim of a prairie fire, and lost to history. Before the funeral train left Washington, however, a sad task was performed when Lincoln's son, Willie, was removed from the Carroll tomb in Georgetown's Oak Hill Cemetery, where he had been placed in 1862 after he had died at the White House. His body was placed in the funeral car along with his dad's for the long trek to Springfield. Willie was buried in a Fisk metallic burial case which had been patented by Almond Duncan Fisk in 1848. It came well recommended. It, it's interesting that after Willie died, his body embalmed and placed temporarily in the Carroll Mausoleum, Lincoln on at least two occasions borrowed the key and visited his son's body in the tomb. The swinging metal plate allowed a visitor to remove the plate and view the deceased through the glass window. In the 19th century, this was not at all unusual. They had a different way of dealing with death than we do. While the train was in New York, the funeral procession was viewed by none other than the future president, Theodore Roosevelt, who at the age of six and a half viewed the procession from the window of his grandfather's house along with his younger, younger brother, uh, <coughs> Elliot. Also in New York, in violation of Secretary of War Stanton's strict instructions, a photograph was taken of Lincoln's body. When he heard of it, he was furious and ordered the prints and glass negative destroyed. His orders were obeyed and all were destroyed except for one print, the one you see. It was delivered to Stanton and remained in the papers, his papers after his death. His son found it and gave it to John Nicolay and John Hay when they were writing their mammoth biography of Lincoln 25 years later. They did not use it, but the picture remained in his papers unknown to the world until 1952, when a 15-year-old boy was doing research in the Illinois State Library and ran across it. This is a reproduction of Lincoln's casket. Notice that it is not rectangular, but is a mummiform type, broader at the shoulders. The fact that for years people thought that there were no photographs of Lincoln's dead body 
did not prevent unscrupulous types from fabricating likenesses of the dead Lincoln that they tried to pass off onto a credulous public. Needless to say, none of these is the real Abraham Lincoln. However, that one could have fooled me. Finally, the funeral train arrived in Springfield, Illinois, and after the funeral service in the House of Representatives chamber of the old Capitol building, which is still there today, Lincoln and Willie were interred in the public receiving vault at Oak Ridge Cemetery on May 4th, 1865. And there, while a more permanent, but yet still a temporary tomb was built on the hill to the, just to the south of it, they rested. Those of you who are observant may have noticed differences between those slides of the receiving vault that made you wonder if I'd made a mistake. A redesign of the vault occurred in about 1901. In May 1865, the National Lincoln Monument Association was formed to establish a more permanent tomb and memorial for Lincoln. Here we see the position of the receiving vault and that temporary tomb, and of course the permanent tomb in the center of that diagram. Where the stone slab is was the location of the temporary tomb that was uh, taken down after it was no longer necessary. You will notice that the temporary tomb when built was exactly like that tomb that had been downtown that was not used. The temporary vault was finished in December 1865 and on December 21st Mr. Lincoln and Willie were transferred to the temporary tomb. At that time, it was thought necessary to replace Mr. Lincoln's original wooden coffin with a metal one. At that time, the coffin was opened and the body viewed for the first time since the open casket funeral in Springfield on May 3rd and 4th, earlier that year. At some point, Mr. Lincoln's other son, Eddie, who had died in Springfield in 1850, was moved to the temporary tomb. In 1868, a contest was conducted to design a final permanent tomb and memorial for Mr. Lincoln, and a $1,000 reward award to the winner was to be presented. There were 37 designs from 31 artists, of whom, of whom six had presented two entries. The winner was Larkin Goldsmith Meade, Jr., who was 33 years old in 1868. Meade was not an architect, but was an artist living in Florence, Italy, and therein lies much of the later problem that w with the tomb that we will encounter. He hired a Florence architect to make the tomb design. And when the National Lincoln Monument Association found out that Meade was not an architect and had, to, had planned to subcontract the architectural work, it had the contract with Meade re rewritten so that the association was responsible for building the architectural part closely following Meade's designs and specifications. He would be responsible for the statuary. Meade left the United States and did not oversee the construction. Its plans, such as they were, were redrawn by Russell Sturgis, Jr., secretary of the American Institute of Architects in New York City. But according to a Peter B. Wright, the plans were, quote, badly garbled when they got to Springfield, end quote. Regardless, William D. Richardson of Springfield was the low bidder to construct the tomb. He was 32 years old and contracted for $136,550. He had not entered the construction business until 1867, although he later became a successful contractor and built the new state capitol at Springfield in the 1870s and 80s. Additional money went to Meade for the bronze sculptures that adorn the monument, although there is speculation about whether he did all the designs himself or contracted with other Florence 
artists. Four years after the bodies had been placed in the temporary tomb, in September 1869, construction began on the final tomb. In the meantime, on July 15, 1871, Thomas Lincoln, called Tad, became the third Lincoln's son to die. While not then finished, the tomb had progressed to the point that Tad could be interred in his permanent crypt. On September 19, 1871, the bodies of Lincoln, Willie, and Eddie were also moved to their permanent resting places in the new Lincoln tomb. Although, as we shall see, nothing is permanent in the Lincoln tomb. At the time when Lincoln was transferred from the temporary tomb to the middle wall crypt to the final one, his casket was opened for the second time, and the body viewed to make sure nothing had happened to it. While the body rested in the wall crypt for the final tomb, the marble sarcophagus was not yet ready. It was ready in 1874, and when they attempted to place the new metal coffin in the marble sarcophagus for permanent burial, it was found that it was too large, and a new coffin of red cedar lined with lead was made. It was placed in the sarcophagus on October 9, 1874, and at that time, the casket was again opened, and Lincoln's body was viewed for the third time. At last, in October 1874, the final tomb was dedicated and finished. As we can see, the catacomb where the bodies of Lincoln and his family rested consisted of an oval chamber with a marble sarcophagus in the center for Mr. Lincoln and five crypts in the wall to the south for members of his family. It was in the center one of these crypts that Mr. Lincoln had lain awaiting the completion of the sarcophagus. Visitors to the tomb could view the sarcophagus containing Mr. Lincoln's body only by looking through the window of the door on the north end of the oval catacomb room. They had to do this from the outside of the tomb. If there is a hero to our story, it is John Carroll Power, who now enters the picture. In 1874, he was hired by the National Lincoln Monument Association to be the custodian of the tomb an indigenous and being a very responsible custodian who, as we will see, fulfilled his duties above and beyond the call of duty. He was an excellent historian who wrote very reliable accounts of the construction of the tomb and the attempt to steal Lincoln's body. Now we're getting to the exciting part. <laughs> These books have been digitally reproduced and are available for a very reasonable price. Yes, there was an attempt to steal Lincoln's body, and therein hangs a tale. It seems the Secret Service had finally captured the country's leading engraver of counterfeit money. His name was Benjamin F. Boyd. He was convicted and sentenced and was serving time in the penitentiary. A man by the name of James B. Big Jim Kennelly was an organized crime type whose counterfeit in business was severely handicapped by the incarceration of Benjamin Boyd. He conceived the idea of kidnapping Lincoln's body and holding it for ransom. The ransom would be the release and holding, uh, the release of uh, uh, Boyd and $200,000 thrown in for good measure, presumably in good non-counterfeit money. Criminal lowlifes were hired to do the deed, but unfortunately for them, boys will talk. The gang was infiltrated by the Secret Service, so on election night, November 7th, 1876, the four kidnappers who were to do the job were actually two crooks and two Secret Service operatives. <laughs> While they were breaking into the oval catacomb room to the north end of the tomb, the oval monument hall on the south contained law enforcement operatives, Mr. Power, the custodian, and yes, a newspaper man. <laughs> After using a, dis a saw to dispose of the padlock on the north door into the catacomb, the thieves entered and began their attempt to get at Lincoln's coffin. The leader took an ax, and like a fireman in his ax, immediately attempted to smash the sarcophagus. 
as his arm was raised to strike the blow, one of the Secret Service informers halted his arm and suggested that they might want to try to pry the lid off. This was done, and they gained access to the lead-lined Lincoln coffin within the marble sarcophagus, which proved too heavy to lift out. <laughs> Then they sawed off the end of the sarcophagus and were attempting to slide it out. Meanwhile, one undercover, cover, uh, one undercover cop had gone around to the memorial room and told them it was time to make the arrest. Out they ran, guns drawn, and when one of those went, guns went off accidentally and the thieves fled into the night. They were later tried, uh, captured, tried, and incarcerated. But what the police, custodian, and newspaper man found was the coffin extruding about 15 inches out of the sarcophagus, the small ornamental lid propped up against the rear wall, and the larger lid turned sideways and resting on the sarcophagus. They put a new padlock on the door and all went home. For two days, the room was left in that state. To show you that the woodcut is an accurate rendition of the tomb, notice this later photograph that shows the alcove in the wall with vertical lines on either side in the paneling. Two days later, Power returned with workers who removed and examined the coffin closely and determined that it had not been opened. They made everything in the crypt as it was before and resealed the casket inside the marble sarcophagus. But John Todd Stewart, the head of the National Lincoln Monument Association and Lincoln's first law partner, did not sleep well for worried about the security of Lincoln's body. After all, merely a new padlock was all that was keeping the same thing from happening again. On November 15th, Stewart returned to the monument and made plans with custodian power. The same workman who had resealed the sarcophagus earlier returned that afternoon and opened the sarcophagus and removed the coffin and placed it alongside of the wall where it could not be seen, be seen by people looking through the window of the door. They then resealed the marble sarcophagus. That night, Power, Stewart, and some other members of the Monument Association returned and carried the coffin of Mr. Lincoln around the east side of the monument through the Memorial Hall and deposited it on some timbers inside near the base of the obelisk. On the ground plan of the tomb, the coffin was placed at A. The plan was to place the coffin in a wooden box and bury it. Wood was brought to the tomb in pieces, not to arouse suspicion, and the box was made. It was extremely difficult to deal with a four to five hundred pound lead lined coffin, but they were able to do it. The men went home and power attempted to dig a hole to bury the coffin. Unfortunately, not only was the water table quite high, but the flat roof of the terrace had leaked a great deal of water into the tomb. He couldn't find anywhere near the coffin to make a dry hole to bury it. He checked with Stuart, and it was decided to leave the coffin on the planks where it was and simply to cover it up with a bunch of loose timbers. That is the, where things stood at the end of 1876. In 1877, some more statuary was being added to the terrace above, and workers were required to enter the tomb to make repairs in the walls to strengthen them to better support the weight of the bronze statues. Power knew that the two workers were bound to discover the coffin, so rather than doing so accidentally, he swore them to secrecy and explained the situation. Within 48 hours, the whole town of Springfield knew. <laughs> Fortunately, the newspapers did not, or at least they did not print what they, do, uh, what they knew. In November 1878, the body of A.T. Stewart, no relation to John Todd Stewart, and the Stewart spelled differently, a wealthy New York merchant was stolen from its tomb. Power and John Todd Stewart were worried anew uh, about the security for Lincoln. 
they decided to, the, to move the body yet again. This time, however, Stewart told Power that he was an old man, as were the others in the Monument Association, and he had suffered a great deal the last time he was called upon to carry a 500-pound coffin around in a cramped, unventilated area. Power was to recruit a younger group of reliable men who could be trusted. A dry place was found, and on November 18, 1878, the coffin was carried to the place marked B and placed so that the top was just below the surface of the dirt floor. The workers had to leave, and power was to fill in the hole and to make the appearance of the dirt floor look natural to avoid any suspicion. Because of high visitation to the tomb, Power did not have time to do so. And the men returned on November 22nd to do themselves, 22nd to do it themselves. After they had finished, they noticed what looked like disturbed earth. They dug down and found the old iron coffin that had been found too large to fit inside the marble sarcophagus. They didn't know the background of that coffin and were alarmed that someone had discovered the burial place recently dug. They dug down and re-exposed the coffin they had just covered over and had buried just four days ago. But when the screws were examined, they saw that it had not been opened, and so they re-buried it in the metal coffin they had just found. This group of younger men called themselves the Lincoln Guard of Honor and swore that they would keep Lincoln's body safe from then on. To fast forward for a minute, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library has in its files this interesting photograph made in 1901 when the entire tomb was dismantled and rebuilt. This is the iron coffin that was discarded when it was found too big to fit into the marble sarcophagus. As I have related, it was uncovered by accident by the Guard of Honor, and they would have naturally reburied it. Here in 1901, it accidentally turns up yet again. The discarded remains of a coffin having once held the body of Abraham Lincoln. While we're on a slight tangent from our story, I would like to dwell a little bit on how history is written. Up until 1990, the only book-length history of the attempt to steal Lincoln's body was written by custodian power in 1887. In 1990, Bonnie Stallman Speer wrote The Great Abraham Lincoln Hijack. A reprinted edition from 1997 is still available. It is excellent. In her description of the removal of Lincoln's body and burial back in the inner recesses of the tomb, she describes its location in the labyrinth of the tomb. And so it was described in one similar way or another until 2007, when author Thomas J. Crawwell wrote Stealing Lincoln's Body. It, too, is excellent, and I highly recommend both of them. Mr. Crawl was the uh, historical consultant for the History Channel's documentary of the same name. The problem here is that starting with Crowell, he describes the bur burial of the body in the basement of the tomb. He even has a chapter entitled, The Body in the Basement. Since he was the consultant in the video, it too has the body buried in the basement. The problem is the tomb does not have and never had a basement in our sense of the word. In the book on the building of the tomb written in 1889 by the custodian power, he clearly describes the tomb and has a cross section of it that shows no basement. When I contacted Mr. Crowell and asked him why he refers to a basement when the tomb never had one, he replied in an email, I took power's description no light, no air, soggy dirt floor. Sounds like an unfinished basement to me. Sheesh. And so now, as far as the world is concerned, the tomb had a basement. This is news to the folks who run the Lincoln tomb. 
and everybody else who has studied the matter. Then in 2012, Jason Emerson published a new and masterful biography of Robert Todd Lincoln, the one son of the Lincolns who survived to adulthood. The book is superb and will change the way people think about Robert Lincoln. All the work of the National Lincoln Monument Association, the Lincoln Honor Guard, and the custodian power in dealing with the tomb and Lincoln's body were cleared with Robert. He was always kept in the loop and gave his approval for all that they did to maintain the security of Lincoln's body. The problem is that when Emerson relates this part of Robert's life, he refers to the body of Lincoln being placed in the basement of the tomb. <laughs> when I contacted Emerson and asked why he said it had a basement when it did not, he replied that he had original letters from John Todd Stewart, the head of the Monument Association, to Robert referring to the basement and having placed Robert's father's body in the basement. Primary sources for historical research don't get any better than original letters from the principals. I explained the nature of the proof that the tomb didn't have a basement and suggested that those letters were using the term basement in its 19th century meaning. That is to say, a basement was the base floor of a building. Only in the 20th century did the word come to mean a subterranean floor. Europeans to this day don't number the floors of buildings as we do. I even gave him an example of Jefferson Davis when he was Secretary of War writing in a letter making the distinction between the basement of a building and its cellar. With that, Mr. Emerson quit answering my emails. <laughs> Such are the trials of the amateur historian. <laughs> And so we return to our story of Lincoln's tomb to November 1878 when the Lincoln Honor Guard had made sure that Lincoln's coffin was buried in the labyrinth of the tomb. Nothing then occurs until July 16, 1882 when Mrs. Lincoln died in Springfield as at the, resi at the residence of her sister, Mrs. Ninian W. Edwards. It was the same house in which she had married Lincoln back in 1842. Her remains were placed in a double lead-lined airtight coffin and placed in crypt number four in the catacomb. At the request of Robert Lincoln, the Guard of Honor met two days after the funeral and removed the coffin of Mrs. Lincoln and buried it alongside that of the already buried body of her husband, Mr. Lincoln, at the spot marked B. Thus, Mrs. Lincoln was in the crypt in the wall of the catacomb room for only two days. Nothing untoward occurred at the 10-year-old tomb until the morning of February 5th, 1884, when a brick arch 70 feet long and spanning the five and a half feet space between the outer wall on the east side and the next one to it fell uh, and collapsed. It only left about 10 feet at each end supporting the heavy flagstones on the terrace above. The remaining flagstones were totally unsupported and would have collapsed at the slightest weight of a visitor walking on them. In making repairs to the tomb, it was decided to improve ventilation of the tomb's innards, and so an opening was made through the three and one half foot brick wall between B on the map and the foundation for the obelisk. That meant that all summer workmen were unknowingly walking over the bodies of the buried president and his wife. In May 1886, it was decided by the Lincoln Monument Association to make more suitable arrangements for the bodies of the Lincolns. The body of Mr. Lincoln was to be buried in the catacomb room directly under the marble sarcophagus with the body lying north and south with the head to the south. Mrs. Lincoln would lie beside him on the east side. The receptacle was to be, quote, 
a pit at the monument five and one half feet wide, eight feet long, and six feet deep, wall around same with an 18 inch wall of hard burned brick laid in good cement mortar concrete between the walls so as to fill the pit with a solid mass." End quote. Ground was broken on April 11th, 1887, and on April 14th, the Lincolns were exhumed from their burials in the labyrinth of the tomb. They were carried from the position marked B to the memorial hall and laid upon trestles. As a matter of protocol, the Lincoln Guard of Honor turned the bodies over to the Lincoln Monument Association, stating that the coffin had not been opened while under its care. The Monument Association then decided that they should view Mr. Lincoln's remains for the fourth time to make sure he was still in his coffin. <laughs> they cut back a flap of the lid, which measured about a foot on each of three sides, and peeled it back. All present viewed the remains and agreed that it was indeed still the body of Mr. Lincoln. Then a plumber resealed the lid and the bodies were conveyed to the catacomb where they were buried. After the coffins were placed in the receptacle, concrete was poured over them up to the level of the floor, which after the concrete had set, was relayed in tessellated marble. The tops of the coffins were four and one half feet below the level of the floor. The public continued to visit the tomb and look through the window and the door on the north end of the catacomb room and view the sarcophagus that they thought contained Lincoln's body. Mr. Lincoln was directly under the sarcophagus and Mrs. Lincoln was alongside him to the east. There they were formally allowed to rest in peace except that they did not. <laughs> the problem was the inadequate foundation that originally had been placed underneath the tomb. It is hard to know who to blame. Was it the artist who was not an architect who designed it? Was it an inexperienced contractor who actually built it? Regardless of blame, the tomb was structurally falling down and was decided in 1899 to completely dismantle the entire tomb and rebuild it properly. In 1990, the job was proceeding and the tomb was coming down. In the course of that restoration, on March 10th, 1900, the bodies of the president and all his family were removed to a temporary tomb northeast of the tomb site. This, of course, involved an extraordinary amount of work, chipping away the concrete to get to Lincoln's coffin to remove it from beneath the floor of the catacomb room. Did they open it this time, the coffin? <laughs> now, these photographs just somewhat difficult to tell whether the coffins are coming or going, but uh, my guess is here we are placing them from the temporary tomb to the more permanent tomb. Now, after exposing the temporary tomb, here we see the coffins of the family, actually the wooden crates in which the coffins would have been. This is probably the smaller children. On April 24th, 1901, Mr. Lincoln and his family were removed from the temporary tomb and Mr. Lincoln was placed in the sarcophagus in the catacomb room and his family members were placed in the redesigned crypts within the wall. 
This placed the body of Mr. Lincoln right back where it started when the kidnapping attempt was made back in 1876. Robert Lincoln was concerned about the security of the tomb and not happy that they were relying only on a stronger door to the catacomb and the fact that the caretaker now lived next door to the tomb. He submitted a plan for embedding Lincoln's body again under concrete below the floor of the catacomb room. This picture shows the newly reconstructed catacomb room after the sarcophagus had been pushed aside and excavations made beneath the floor to allow for the metal cage and concrete in which to embed Mr. Lincoln's coffin. <clears throat> On September 26, 1901, the body was removed from the sarcophagus and carried to Memorial Hall for identification. <laughs> Anticipating what would happen that day on September 26, 1901, Joseph P. Lindley, one of the Lincoln Honor Guard, told his 13-year-old son, Fleetwood Lindley, to take his bicycle to school and if he was summoned, to pedal as fast as he could to the cemetery. Mr. Lindley was correct in thinking that as on four occasions before, the coffin of Mr. Lincoln would be opened and viewed to make sure he was still there. Two plumbers were on hand to cut through the lead lining. Robert Lincoln had indicated that the coffin was not to be opened, but the consensus of those doing the work was that Robert wasn't there. <laughs> when Mr. Lincoln knew they would open it, he sent word to school and his son pedaled furiously to the tomb. There, the 13-year-old, by virtue of outliving all the others, became the last surviving man to view the remains of Abraham Lincoln. He died on February 1st, 1963. This was the fifth and last time since the funeral at Springfield that Lincoln's coffin was opened and the body viewed. On September 26, 1901, when Lincoln was interred in his final resting place, he was surrounded by a metal cage three by three by eight feet in a vault measuring eight by eight by 15 feet. The cage rests on a four inch thick concrete base. The entire vault was filled with cement to the level of the underside of the burial chamber. Dr. Wayne Temple, foremost authority of the Lincoln tomb, believes Mrs. Lincoln was placed there alongside him, but that is simply not proven. And so, yet again, Mr. Lincoln was allowed to finally rest in peace. Not so fast. <laughs> For about 30 more years, visitors to the tomb would again peer through the window and the door on the north end of the catacomb room to view the marble sarcophagus. Presumably, by this time, everyone knew that Lincoln's body was in the concrete fill vault below it. And there he has remained undisturbed until today. But during those years, the tomb continued to deteriorate, and by 1930, major repairs were needed. The tomb's granite veneer was breaking away from its backing. It was decided to redesign the interior of the tomb, providing lighting and ventilation and giving visitors an access to the burial site within the tomb, rather than having to gaze through the window of the door from the outside. Work began on May 12, 1930, and as it proceeded, they found the tomb in worse condition than they anticipated. It began with the removal of the granite skin of the monument, but then it was decided to dismantle the entire structure except for the lower sections of the major masonry masses and the outer wall. Now I am sure that you and I are both wondering, what is it with the folks in Illinois and their tomb building skills? <laughs> Richard Nickel, a leader of the modern historic preservation movement, famously said, great architecture has only two natural enemies, water and stupid men. 
I feel quite certain that both of these contributed to the structural problems of the Lincoln tomb. In 1901, 15 feet had been added to the top of the obelisks. Up until 1930 uh, and that renovation, there had been a spiral stairway allowing visitors to climb to the top. In 1930, that was removed. In the past, visitors to the tomb had entered the memorial room to view some museum relics and then exited to walk around the tomb to look through the window at the sarcophagus. Now, they entered the memorial hall and walked through beautiful corridors to reach the burial room. As part of the redesign of the interior of the tomb, the crypt containing the bodies of the Lincoln family was moved. This picture was taken at the 1901 restoration and shows the family caskets probably being replaced in the rebuilt crypt. Here we see the new arrangement of the family crypt after 1931. But before we take a tour of the restored tomb as it existed today, we must first make the obligatory rub of Mr. Lincoln's nose for luck and view the outside of the tomb. In addition to the statue of Mr. Lincoln, are four sculptured groups represented in the Navy, artillery, and cavalry. Today, we enter what used to be called Memorial Hall. Formerly, this room was a museum. Now, there is a statue of Lincoln in the center. Turning to the right or left, you can walk corridors or galleries down either side of the tomb to arrive at the burial room at the north end. At each corner are statues of Mr. Lincoln. Here is the last public appearance of the marble sarcophagus that once held Lincoln's body. Here, Mr. Herbert Fay, the custodian of the tomb at the time, is viewing it after it had been removed from the tomb for the 1930 restoration. Sometimes during that period, it was either vandalized or destroyed by an industrial accident. Either way, fragments were carted off as souvenirs. A surviving piece can be seen in the rotunda. Other surviving fragments are behind the scenes. Mr. Lincoln now lies embedded in the concrete two and one half feet behind the front edge of the stone that you see and 10 feet below, lying parallel to the stone with his head to the west and his feet to the east. The folks who run the Lincoln Tomb State Historical Site were gracious enough to allow my wife and me to enter the innermost recesses of the tomb where visitors are not allowed. Access is made from the old mon monument room or rotunda through the, in the door, a door in the north side. I do not exaggerate when I call it a labyrinth. There's my wife, Jo. The inside is confusing because of the reworking done over the years. Some passages have been blocked up and walls have been cut through. There are three noteworthy locations to experience. Here we are looking at the bricked up entrance to the obelisk. Just on the other side of that walled up door is the outside entrance where people entered the obelisk and climbed the spiral staircase to the top. Since 1930, the spiral, st spiral staircase has been removed and replaced with this wall-mounted ladder, and the public no longer has access to the obelisk. Here I am standing on the spot where Lincoln was first placed in that labyrinth, and the arrows indicate the direction the camera was pointed. Here is where his coffin sat under the pile of wood for over two years. On the other side of the corridor where people view Lincoln's burial moment, there is a wall on which, on which are the names of Lincoln's family. Their burial crypts are in a huge box behind that wall. 
Here I am standing on that box, which contains the body of Mrs. Lincoln, maybe, and sons Edward, Willie, and Tad. Below this box or crypt, and a few B feet back under it, is the spot where Mr. Lincoln was buried under the dirt floor for nine years. The tomb continues to have periodic water problems from the flat terrace, but by and large, the structural problems are presumably over. And finally, after all the moving and viewing and the building and rebuilding Mr. Lincoln, not only our greatest president, but in my opinion, America's greatest man, can indeed finally rest in peace. I would be happy to entertain any questions. Did you and Joe look for the basement when you were over there? <laughs> we couldn't find that basement. And we looked for it. And you visit the Alamo and find the basement there like Pee Wee Herbert tries here. Yes. And when, if you have a question, speak loudly because I'm deaf as a post in my right ear. Well, yes? Who actually owns that? Is that a city? That's a state, that's a state historical site. State of Illinois owns that. Is, it a, is there other cem uh, cemetery spots there? Or just... Just say, well, that's right in the middle of Oak Ridge Cemetery. Oh, okay. Uh, so there's the public cemetery all around it. Oh, thank you. Uh, Clay, with all those problems with, Grant, with Lincoln, who's buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the humorous answer to that tomb is nobody, because Grant's not buried in Grant's tomb. He's in a crypt above ground. Oh, where's your partner? In tomb. Uh, yeah, Mike's here to, to, to understand questions since I can't hear. <laughs> yes? Uh, where is his living, Tom Lincoln buried at, do you know? Tom Lincoln is buried somewhere east of Springfield where he died, where he lived after he moved to Springfield on a farm. Uh, any other questions? Um, Tom, Tom was, where is Robert Lincoln? Robert Lincoln is buried in National uh, uh, Arlington National Cemetery which he uh, deserves to be buried there because he was a, a soldier in the waning weeks of the war. But um, he always assumed that he would be buried in Springfield with, uh, with his family. But Mrs. Robert Lincoln thought otherwise. She thought he needed his own place in the sun, and she had him buried at Arlington. Now, when his son Jack, Lincoln's grandson, who was Abraham Lincoln, uh, uh, the second. When he died in uh, 1890, I believe, his body was put in the crypt at Springfield. And in 1927, when son Robert Lincoln died and, and went to Arlington, they took Jack from Springfield and buried him alongside his father in Arlington. <coughs> Sir? What did the early children die of? Who knows? Typhoid, uh, some of the typical diseases of the time, cholera, there's no telling why. <laughs> Dirty yes. Your presentation was very well researched, and I'm wondering what prompted you to begin this journey. Well, I've always had an interest in Lincoln, uh, but the thing that precipitated this program and all the research that went into it was hearing uh, uh, the word basement used when I knew it didn't have one. And I wanted to get, if you'll pardon the phrase, to the bottom of that story. So but, but once you start something like that, as you well know, it keeps pulling you in, pulling you in further and further. But that was the, the thing that started me. Yes, ma'am. The state of Illinois. Yeah, they own it. It's theirs. If they screw it up, building it, they gotta fix it. <laughs> yes. Is there any truth to that? Robert started refusing the request of uh, president to visit them because uh, two or three dying, including his father, just before, uh, just after his visit to those presidents. Oh. Uh, since, since Robert had a close association with uh, three presidential assassinations, he. The, the story is that he then refused to visit other presidents, thinking that he was a curse on living presidents. I'm not sure how much truth there is, but 
Robert Lincoln was a very private man. To have certainly a public uh, a role as president of the Pullman Company, as Secretary of War uh, later, but, but nonetheless, he was a private, relatively shy man who was, would probably have been looking for a reason not to visit uh, presidents. Any other questions? In your research, Mary Lincoln, you know, she had some mental problems, but that's pretty, in your research, she had some serious mental problems? I tend to think, yes, that Mrs. Lincoln had her problems, yes. However, to give the devil his due, living with Abraham Lincoln would have been a problem. <laughs> But I think Mrs. Lincoln did have some mental issues. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I forgot, I forgot oh, to make an answer.